celebrating with your teams, you know, there tends to be a lot of alcohol. There tends to be a lot of potential late nights because service can go into late nights. And, you know, I think in general, done at a healthy pace, it's a common practice across the industry. And I think what we've seen over the years is more discussion around, okay, when does it become unhealthy? Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Burnt Chef Journal, a hospitality-specific podcast dedicated to challenging mental health stigma and conversations designed to inspire a new, healthier, happier, and more sustainable hospitality profession. The Burnt Chef Journal is proudly sponsored by Plan Day, the workforce management system that helps your business give a shift. From scheduling rotors ahead to tracking time and attendance, managing your team's careers to managing your budgets, Plan Day has everything you need to make your day work in one easy-to-use platform. Try it yourself with a 30-day free trial only at planday.com. Get your shift together with Plan Day. And we are live which is rather not you know i really annoy myself because that's how i start every podcast at the moment it's great on me i'm joined this week by alice cheng who we've had a bit of a discussion i agreed that i was probably going to butcher the introduction quite tremendously so alice i wanted to first and foremost thank you on to the burnt chef journal this week i hope you're doing really well i'm great how are you good good the sun's shining in the uk which for End of October after a storm is quite impressive. Whereabouts in the world are you, Alice? I am in Manhattan in New York, and the sun is also shining, and it's, I think, going to be like 80 degrees Fahrenheit today, <laughs> which is also oh. odd for us. <laughs> yeah, I hear you guys have had some serious temperatures recently, right? Yep. No, I'm not complaining, although I do love the fall. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean... We are very quickly heading into it over here, so I hope that it doesn't suddenly snap on its head and, and yeah. jump the completely opposite way into Arctic blizzards. But Alice, before I waffle on and, and <laughs> end up making an absolute tip myself, I want to open the floor to you. And if you would be ever so kind, because you've got a really extensive bio, so I'm not sure what to start with. Would you mind just explaining to our dedicated listeners just a little bit about yourself, please? Yeah, sure. I am founder and CEO of Culinary Agents, which is the hospitality industry's hiring platform. We have over 2 million users across the U.S. and support about 50,000 businesses from fine dining to fast casual, as well as food service. But that is about my company, not about me. I'm from New York. I worked in hospitality and restaurants and hotels when I was younger, and I loved it. I loved the industry, everything about it. But, and I'm going to date myself, you know, years and years ago, it wasn't necessarily a career path that was an obvious one. It was kind of something you did, you enjoyed, you worked hard, you learned a bunch of skills, and then you went off and did other things. And other things for me led me to work at IBM. I am a mailroom story. I started in the mailroom at IBM because it wasn't my intent to work in technology. I actually was enamored with advertising and communications. And I the advertising firm that supported IBM would not hire me. So I said, great, well, I'm going to just go in through the IBM route. But I ended up loving it. I had so many opportunities. IBM such a huge company. At the time, technology was really at a tipping point into digital. And I got to work on some really awesome projects, bringing in all the sports marketing online. E-commerce was a new thing back then. And the dot-com boom, if you will. Oh, man, I'm really dating myself. But digital and the, the future of unstructured content was an area that I was very excited about. Music, video, images, what would that look like in the future and this pre-iPhone? How could companies you know, manage these things and monetize them? And so it took me to Silicon Valley and work with Netflix was my baby and got to just work with so many great technology and startup companies. And throughout this time, my friends were, I gravitated towards hospitality people. I loved going to restaurants and I ended up naturally helping them find jobs and connecting with each other for opportunities. And, you know, I thought, don't you have something like LinkedIn meets like match.com for jobs or something to help you, you know, connect for these types of opportunities? And the answer was always no. But, you know, I went on my merry way at IBM and forged my own career path there. I spent 13 years there and got to work out of many different countries. And it was just pretty glorious for me coming through the mailroom. But I couldn't shake the fact that there wasn't a tool to support 
you know, this awesome industry and these people that, you know, my spare time, I would help. And I finally got to the point where I was like, okay, well, I talked to myself, I gave myself a pep talk and I'm like, stop complaining that there isn't one and just create one. And so Culinary Agents was born. And so it's set up like a LinkedIn meets match.com for jobs, but it's really a job marketing and applicant tracking tool for businesses and a easy way for people to find and apply jobs on the talent side. That's, can we just take a moment here? Like you've gone from working in a mailroom in Silicon Valley to identifying and establishing a need within a sector that isn't yours, as in the same way as it wasn't mine, you know, other than a, a quick free song, <laughs> and then came up with a fix. That's incredible. And it's not just you know, a small little blip on the radar. You said 2 million, is that a year? No, 2 million hospitality users, over 2 million. So we add about 50 to 60,000 new users per month. Everything from, you know, executive chef to dishwasher and front of house, you know, servers, bussers, general managers, et cetera. That's incredible. Congratulations. Thank you. And actually today, which I don't know when this is going to air, but today, October 22nd, we just launched a new sister platform called hospitalitycareerpaths.com which totally focuses on hospitality careers, as you would guess, but also the first site that really lays out pay and benefits data across the industry and in a tool form to allow people to, you know, again, equip people with information to help them better plan, better decide, inspire them. There's career advice on there. We feature over 500 hospitality leaders of all shapes and sizes, walks of, of the industry. And the focus is how do we continue to inspire? How do we inspire the existing workers? How do we inspire the people who are entering the industry? And how do we inspire the people who have been in the industry for a really long time? And well, again, congratulations on a new platform. You say it's been launched today. Yes, October 22nd, as of this morning. (laughs) And uh, come on then, scores on the doors. What are we looking at in terms of engagement? Can you see any live information? Have you got any key headlines? I'm interested. (laughs) <laughs> putting me on the spot. I have not actually dug into the analytics yet, but I will do as soon as we finish recording. <laughs> yeah. we're, very, we're very excited. It's really been part of our core mission from the very beginning, as far as helping people succeed in this industry. The hospitality career paths section used to be within another section of culinary agents in the resource section. So it's not something new. We've been collecting this information for many years and sharing it. But it needed its own spotlight. It needed an area that was dedicated, that shows examples of how people got to where they are and advice that they have for the industry, coupled with, you know, pay and benefits data. When you search for different positions in different cities, skills, expectations, all the tools that really support people with like, you know, what's your potential? What do you want to do? Who has done it? What could you potentially earn? You know, what do businesses expect of you if you want to earn on the upper side of the you know spectrum. The goal is to give the information to help, again, motivate, inspire, or just inform. Maybe it's, you know, okay, this isn't my long-term goal to stay in the industry, but I recognize how all the skills I'm learning and acquiring now are going to benefit me in the future. And then maybe that in and of itself supports somebody in a different way that they hadn't expected. That's such an interesting functionality of a tech platform, though, isn't it? To say that, okay, you are able to think on the spot, be adaptable, be creative, multitask. Here yeah. are some other careers that might These be. These are skills that are extremely valuable beyond, you know, the hospitality industry. And more and more businesses are valuing it. And that's what we're seeing in people's career paths. And I think it's great. I think the hospitality industry is kind of a feeder to the working population. You know, so many people started in the industry, whether it was just, you know, temporary or something that was a side hustle. And a lot of people and more and more people are staying in it. And, you know, some people are moving on into other things, but they're taking what they learned and all the skills, the valuable skills and bringing that into another industry. True. I mean, I'm really keen to try and keep people in this sector for as long as possible. Well, I think that one of the things that we sort of established the work that we do with colleges in places like Miami and Auckland and the UK, certain parts of the UK, is that when people come into a career in hospitality, they believe that a career is, I need to be a chef or a server. That's it. Those are my two opportunities, right? 
but in reality you know you've got a whole ecosystem that makes this industry incredible from delivery drivers to salespeople to manufacturers of ovens to you know groundskeepers and maintenance engineers etc so it's really really important for us to be able to keep that feed through and i guess that's where the platforms that you have now come into force really is making sure that people understand that this is an entire ecosystem that needs supporting and, and needs continual work as an improvement right absolutely and so for those who haven't come across culinary agents right now it's very easy to look around i'm also seeing jobs on here in london as well so you're not just exclusively states right no, we're not. We are global. You can find a lot of things. We did actually do a bit of a launch in the UK specifically, also France and Italy several years ago. It was, it was a little bit of a learning. It was more for learning process. But we do have clients in the UK. The wonderful thing about this industry as well is that businesses grow and they expand and they bring their hospitality to other countries. And so we've kind of organically grown just because a lot of our clients here in the U.S., have expanded and or businesses that we know in the UK have expanded to the US and vice versa and then realize that our tools actually work really well, regardless of what country you're in. A little bit of an easier transition to the UK because of language, a little more challenging when you have to localize language and translate real time. But, you know, the hospitality industry is universal. There are a lot of common I would say expectations and skills and, you know, behaviors and mannerisms that do cross borders. And, you know, I think with more of that happening and more people having the opportunity to experience work in different areas, and that just enriches and, and add that to the skills pile of, of experience, right? Yeah, and I think that you touched upon something there, that which is quite critical and it's understood, but not really comprehended, which is hospitality is universal. And you don't necessarily need to speak the language of the country that you're in. You're able to get jobs pretty much anywhere in the world, right? And that's that's quite interesting. But I think what also from, and I'm going to throw you an absolute curveball here that wasn't on the questions list, but what's really interesting to me is because it is universal, we tend to see from our experience a lot of the same things repeated. Never necessarily repeats, but it rhymes, right? It's, it, there's similarities. Are there any specific learnings that you've had over the last sort of 12 years or so in the line of work and the level of data and the people that you're working with where you've seen some real key pinch points of the industry that you just continually hear about no matter where you're operating? Yeah, you know, there are several. I'll focus on the positive first. You know, there is a common thread of if you're talking about passion, kind of this, this desire to offer hospitality, make other people feel welcome, feel cared for, not just, you know, doing service, but really providing that next level of hospitality, right? Making somebody feel cared for and, and welcome. So there is definitely a commonality around the passion that people have in the industry for those who are just driven on a day-to-day -day basis to serve others and to make sure that they're, they're creating the best experiences for the ones that they're caring for. With that, it's also a very exciting industry that works really hard in a very condensed time, usually, you know, if you're talking about restaurants specifically, and then there's this kind of energy release at the end, you kind of, you know, mini celebrate with your team that, you know, you had a successful service or whatnot. And I think over the years, you know, having these little celebrations, being around, you know, a high energy, high, you know, all those stress points, if you will, and then, you know, celebrating with your teams, you know, there tends to be a lot of alcohol, there tends to be a lot of potential late nights, because service can go into late nights. And, you know, I think, in general, done at a healthy pace, it's a common practice across the industry. And I think what we've seen over the years is more discussion around, okay, when does it become unhealthy? When does it become something that needs to be checked in on? And I think we've seen, again, switching it back to the positive, so many people being very vocal about, hey, if you're going to sustain this, if you're going to be in this industry and you want to continue doing what you love and serving others and all this stuff, you got to take care of yourself. And I think that's something that we're seeing very commonly more and more like people talking about it openly is that take care of yourself and take care of each other in the hospitality industry. Don't just take care of other people. Yeah. And I couldn't have said it better. Thank you. I mean, I think that the we have a PR problem in hospitality, right? When I said you're interacting, 
Yeah, do you? I haven't watched any of your interviews. So just for context, Alice does a lot of interviews on TV, including Bloomberg, which I deliberately don't tend to do too much deep diving before I meet my guests because I'm interested. It's like a conversation. Like, like you've met at a bar or you've bumped into each other on the subway or something. It's about just learning and exploring. But it does have a PR route. You speak to anyone outside. You go to any of your previous tech colleagues and go, hey, I work in hospitality. And they go, oh, yeah, really stressful, <laughs> long hours. And you're like, okay, great. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because when you speak to people who have been in hospitality for a long time as well, they go, yeah, really stressful, really long hours. And you're like, hold on, aren't we meant to be the guardians of our PR here and be promoting it? So what can we do to change that, Alice? I mean, if you're if we're both speaking the same language, what can we do to sort of address that? Yeah, well, I'm so glad you asked that. So I also say that this industry, there have been and there continues to be, and this is pre-COVID and, and throughout COVID, is all the media focusing on the negative, right? You know, that, that's better clickbait. Those stories are a little bit more spicy. We want to talk about all the negative things in the industry. And, you know, where's all the positive stuff? You know, when you get together with the hospitality industry, or if you go to some conferences, there's so many wonderful things about the industry, the people, the opportunities, the exposure, the learnings to, you know, wine, to culture, meeting the farmers, meeting the producers, et cetera. There's so many things about the industry that don't get the spotlight in the same capacity as the scandal or the negative things. And one of the reasons why you know, it was so important for us to break out Hospitality Career Paths into its special platform is the only thing we're doing is celebrating the industry. We're highlighting the career paths of people, how they got there, the advice. It's kind of a virtual mentorship, if you will, for the industry of people who may not get the opportunity to meet somebody that they admire or somebody that they saw on television or an interview or, or they had their cookbook or dined at their restaurant. It's an opportunity to get advice from leaders who have navigated in their own way this industry and are wanting to share because they recognize that the power of sharing their stories and successes and advice is going to inspire and push the positive message of here's your potential. If you want to do it, it can be done. Here are hundreds of examples of how people did it their own way. You know, you could follow the path that you choose and you could figure out what works for you when it works for you. And there's not that many industries that welcome people from anywhere at all levels of skill. We'll bring them in, teach them, nurture them, if you will. And then if they leave them, they'll accept them to come back. You know, it's, it's kind of like the center of gravity. So many people have left the industry for a little bit and said, you know what? Grass is not greener. I loved what I was doing before. Why did I leave? Right. <laughs> Yeah. And so those stories, those stories in any form, in snippets, in us encouraging people to share those stories, because sometimes you got to pull them out of people, right? Because, you know, people are humble. A lot of people, you know, want to focus on their craft. They don't want to share about their own successes. And we're like, no, let us be your platform. Let us be your cheerleader. We want to talk about how great, you know, your decisions were and how great your advice is, because that's going to help. That's not just going to help the people who want to work in the industry. It's going to shed a light to the people who love to dine at restaurants, who mm -hmm. love to go out and eat, who complain they can't get a table at the hot spot. Okay, well, there's humans in there serving you, preparing your food, running around to make sure that your napkins are pressed, right? They matter. They matter a lot. And there needs to be more of that focus. That's what we're pushing for, right? You know, our information, hospitalitycareerpaths.com is free. It's open to everybody. You can go to it. It's a culmination of years of reporters asking me for trending data on who's offering what and blah, blah, blah. And us controlling the narrative to say, yes, there is a trend. More businesses are offering, at least in the States, it's a little different than in other countries, but they're offering benefits. They are putting in place frameworks and structures and systems that really allow people to be in the industry as a career, start a family, you know, grow their skills, have more opportunities. And, you know, not to say that this didn't exist 20 years ago, but it has evolved and people's priorities have shifted as well. Yeah. Thank you for that as well. Cause it's so, it's so important that we look at this, not just as a stopgap or something that, you know, as a second class job, you know, or third class job is something that you fall into. We don't really get much of a choice in when, in fact, going back to one of the first points that you made about balance and well-being, hospitality is addictive. 
and that doesn't necessarily always have to be bad like addiction can be good you can be addicted to working out and eating well and you know addicted to good stuff it's when that addiction starts to disrupt your life that it becomes unhealthy but it's actually quite good to have you know hospitality in your blood and so I guess then, not to sound like a journalist, but is there any particular shifts or changes? You mentioned that the states are a little bit ahead of some other countries. I'm always curious to sort of probe these thought processes because both of us obviously work just not just in our domestic country of origin. Are there any particular developments or major profound moments that the restaurant industry in, in the States has had in terms of perks, benefits, anything that they've implemented that has really revolutionized the way that things are being done in terms of hiring? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things. And, you know, obviously, another common universal challenge we all had was COVID. And I think that kicked some things into higher gear that were already kind of being developed as far as support structures for hospitality workers and, and businesses. You know, one is a couple of these organizations that really focus on supporting hospitality workers. And that's something that wasn't a new thing pre-COVID, but it definitely made it so obvious that it was so needed. And I was I was happy to see that you had Jen Heidinger Kendrick on previous to this. She's a friend. Yeah. She's amazing. The Giving Kitchen is awesome. And just one example of an organization that, you know, comes together to support hospitality workers. You know, Southern Smoke Foundation is another wonderful one, as well as Ben's Friends. So a lot of these organizations that are not only supporting hospitality workers at their time of need and crises, but also programs like mental health programs, things that not only changes the stigma, it puts it out there as an open conversation and makes treatment accessible and free Mm -hmm. or covered or subsidized. And it's really put an extra focus on let's take care of ourselves and take care of each other, meaning the hospitality industry. And it's okay to ask for help. Previous people, people that you admire, leaders have also asked for help and they're in different places now and they're sharing their stories, which is inspiring more people to even just recognize that they might need a little something and you know, know exactly where to go to get that support. So I would say some of that is, you know, I don't want to say it's a trend because, you know, trends go away. I think it's definitely something that got more attention and continues to grow and get stronger as we see. As far as businesses and hiring trends around that space, you know, as I mentioned, having this industry be a profession requires change. Businesses definitely started looking at how can they offer benefits of sorts. You know, the U.S. is a little different in the sense where, you know, it's a tipping culture. There's challenges around, you know, availability and cost of providing health insurance and other benefits to your employees. There's different laws by state, you know. So there's other challenges that, you know, both business owners and hospitality workers have to face that are just Mm -hmm. different than other countries. And businesses looking holistically at how do we better support our teams and in turn support our business right? and, and our, our guests better serve our guests because we have team members and, and employees that are being cared for differently. And so some of that may take on the form of benefits. Some of it may take on the form of training programs, access to certain things. It may be a double down focus on the culture and how the culture is maintained and nurtured within a work environment. So there's a lot of different ways that different businesses are approaching it. And we always say, you know, do what you can because a small business, a small independent restaurant or or cafe may not have the same ability or, or access to resources than a larger company that just may have more resources. But there are so many creative ways that we've seen businesses really kind of round out their employer brand and decide like, this is what we're going to stand for. And this is what we're going to offer. And here are the resources that we have, you know, for ourselves and our team. And, you know, this is how we're going to operate going forward. If you're enjoying this week's episode, consider heading over to our website and supporting our ongoing work in destigmatizing mental illness and creating a healthier, happier, and more sustainable industry by purchasing some of our branded merchandise. We have a whole range of t-shirts, hoodies, chef's jackets, well-being journals, plus a whole host more available on Worldwide Dispatch. All funds raised from sales of these items go towards 
free to access e-learning content, as well as providing free support systems and help for those who may be experiencing difficulty with their mental health. Yeah, and it's so important to note, I think at this juncture, that everyone thinks that to bring your business into the 21st century in terms of culture, in terms of benefits, you have to spend a lot of money. But it's not the case at all, is it? Like, you, it's small things. Leading from the front as a CEO is is a key thing, you know, not working out of hours and contacting people and expecting them to be readily available even during their own private time is fundamentally, it doesn't cost a single penny other than a bit of respect and time. So it, I think it's, I'm quite keen to encourage operators of all sizes. It doesn't matter whether you're a mum and pop restaurant or you're a, you know, you're a multi-site hotel chain. You've got to start by looking about what more can you do as an individual to be able to start to create that change, right? One of the things that became apparent about five years ago when I started this was it's such a massive, massive project. And this is why we're called the Burn Chef Project, because it's not just a case of providing just one solution, like provide mental health support or provide insurance for medical or for therapy. There's a myriad of different things that are all connected that, that all work together. Are there any specific stories that spring to mind when it comes down to real success stories of perhaps someone who turns their approach or their organization around within your circle? I think a couple of examples would be the organizations I mentioned before, as far as, you know, specifically Ben's friends with Steve Palmer, who had a very personal story. And he's a very successful restaurateur here in the US with, you know, I think like 25 or so restaurants. So, uh, you know, a seasoned business owner, but also openly shares about some of his challenges and and why he started Ben's Friends and, and, you know, giving a space to people to come together and, you know, have support and have a support system. You see, you know, Jen with her personal story with her late husband. So kind of things that have positive things, organizations that have come out because of examples or specific situations from somebody. You know, I think we're seeing more and more stories about individuals who are talking openly about their personal struggles with, whether it be with alcohol or with even, I would say, anxiety and personal, you know, behaviors of how people used to act a certain way, whether it be how they treated stress or how they manage stress and their outlets of stress and how they've changed their perspective and how they manage their own stresses. And in turn, that supports kind of their overall work environment or their team environment. And that's really important as well. Right? it's a big shift in that overall environment, the overall environment of it's stressful enough to be, you know, in a kitchen or be in service, adding to that, you know, that unnecessary additional stress of, you know, somebody else either yelling or, you know, that feeling of of anxiety doesn't help the problem. No. A clip that I saw that would be perfect if we were to do a reel right now is Gordon Ramsay smashing plates in an American Hell's Kitchen episode. But uh, Which is for television, right? You know, yeah. uh, Jeff Ramsey is a, a very nice person, you know, and I don't see him throwing plates and, you know, <laughs> when the cameras are off. That's the most ironic thing, isn't it? Is that the people within my s- circle who know him personally um, also say exactly the same thing. He's the nicest yeah. bloke you'll ever meet. Yeah. <laughs> and that's where, you know, and that's a, I'm going to run with this for a little bit because I think, I think what media has done for this industry is, is wonderful over the past 20 plus years. It has shared so much about the industry, chefs, the craft, the competitions, whatever. It just made it a very exciting, interesting, relatable industry. And they created all sorts of content. And that continues to happen. I think, you know, it's proven time and time again, it makes great TV. And there's a lot of people interested in consuming this content. Throw in social media, throw in all these other things. And you can kind of get all different views and perspectives of the industry, working in it, dining in it, you know, all the stuff. Now is the time to highlight more of the the reality slash wonderful things about the industry. And, you know, I think one of the reasons why The Bear, if you've seen it, and was so popular 
amongst hospitality workers specifically, is it really showed like the reality, the human side of a lot of things. And it allowed other people to relate to the industry differently. And, you know, media plays an important role here. It's done its great job highlighting things and it's latched on to, you know, the plate throwing and all that stuff that, you know, maybe gets some additional viewers. And, but that's not the reality. And, <laughs> you know, and great TV, as we all know, and sometimes is not the reality. Most of the time is not the reality. And so I think we are hitting that, that shift too. The more, more of these podcasts and, and stories and, and all the stuff that's happening, it's to answer your previous question, like collectively, that's what we do. We keep getting these things out. We talk about it. We share it and we get people to listen, right? It's like, yeah, you can read the article about why your burger costs, you know, $30 or whatever. And, you know, the breakdown of costs and everything that goes into it. But the other side, and, and that's real, that's a reality. And then the other side of it is, yes, and you're supporting an industry of professionals who choose to do this for a living and prepare this food and serve it to you so that you don't have to do your dishes when you get home. And it's give and take. It's let's show both sides of it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about so many t- <laughs> things. Yeah, we have. But you know what? Well, that's what passionate people do. We we are on a level and we discuss and we talk. And I think that's a really, high, a really, really powerful point to highlight here, which is when you are watching things like The Bear or you are watching Gordon Ramsay, understand that it is just, that's entertainment, kids. That's, you know, and I'm not absolving. There are still restaurants that think that that is the way to behave, but they are becoming so so minute in the grand scheme of things because eventually they're conforming they understand that if they continue to act like that they're not going to get money but like in the same way if you watch an apocalyptic zombie drama you're not going to walk out your front door and expect there to be zombies you know that what you see on tv is just for entertainment it is not to be learned like a youtube crash course on how to manage a kitchen or a workplace if you're doing it that then you're fucking doing it wrong <laughs> and stop Please stop because it's hurting people. But other than that, actually, there are some really cool. We did a burnt brunch over at a new place that's opened up in Canary Wharf. I don't know if Fallow was ever open when you were in the UK. Did you ever meet meet the guys at Fallow? I didn't meet them, but I recognize the name. Really, really high volume site, cracking concepts, a lot, a lot to do with sustainability. But we were chatting to them about some of the processes and things that they'd implemented recently. And do you know what? I, I think I might, we'll, we'll grab them both on a podcast as well, Will and Jack. But they were talking about how they've got like three day working weeks in place now for their teams. And these three day working weeks aren't three days where you do 16 hours a day and get absolutely slammed for it. They're three longer days, but they are three and a half, like, you know, shorter week all in all. But then the other things they were talking about, which I think is so incredible, especially when you start looking at things like you know, baseball and some of the like, things like NFL, where you've got load bearing and stress management, right? Mm-hmm. So if you've got players who are starting to show the signs of fatigue, rather than just come from the team and tell them they can't come back, you adjust the things that are causing the, the pressure. And they were saying you know, how they will cut items off the menu. You know, customers not going to know it. They're not going to care. They're going to be a little bit upset if their favorite item isn't there, but they're still going to eat and they're still going to have a great experience. So if it's going to push the team too much, they cut those items or they get things in prepped or they start looking at how they can build resilience or uh, like there's just so many more things that organizations are doing now that you go, this is the future of hospitality. And and as you you said uh, numerous times, it's about getting those stories out there. So on a more personal note, there's something that's it's not bold on my screen, but it's just standing out to me with bright neon lights. And I'd like to just, I'm just going to throw it out there and, and hear what you have to say. Make sacrifices with a purpose. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's one of the, <laughs> the, you wrote it, or it's been written, but um, it's a profound life lesson. Make sacrifices with a purpose. Can you expand on that? Yes. You know, and I believe it was in the context of just talking about also, you know, when you're looking at what you want to do as, as an individual and I'm, I'm a naturally, you know, self-motivating driven person. I work really hard. I have to kind of take, take a step back and sometimes I can get tunnel vision of like, okay, and go, let's get there, execute and all that good stuff. Everyone has their quirks. That's mine. You know, when you start your own company, And, you know, for me, after 13 years, 
there was never a good time to start culinary agents. I thought about it for six years. I kind of monitored what was available out there. But I didn't have, you know, I didn't come from money. I didn't have a safety net. I was living in Manhattan, spending more than my paycheck on rent. You know, I used to joke around with some of my memories were like, you know, I used to get that 99 cent slice of pizzas, a dollar six after tax, you know, and that was my meal of the day. And, you know, I just, I did it. I loved it. I lived in the city and I worked and, and was, it was fine. It was the sacrifice. That's a sacrifice with a purpose, right? You know, when I quit IBM, I cash out my 401k to fund the initial, you know, development of culinary agents. That was a big sacrifice. But the goal was, you know, I'm all in. Let's do it. You know, if this doesn't work out, I will find something else. And, you know, I think throughout throughout life in general, you have to make sacrifices. And as I've gotten older and I've started a family and, you know, I met my husband along the way and, you know, you have to make sacrifices. And I think that that can be taken into any context for whatever is true to you at your given moment of the choices that you're trying to make. Do you have a great opportunity to work with a wonderful team in a different city that you're not really keen to live in? Okay, well, maybe that's a sacrifice. What's the purpose of that sacrifice? Are you looking to change your career path or your job or whatever for whatever reason? Okay, make your sacrifices, but make sure that sacrifice is for a reason. Like it's, it's a give and take. No, very true. There's a, there's a phrase you use that go all in. It's very reminiscent of Grant Cardone. <laughs> I was reading his 10X book. You got to be obsessed. You got to go all in. I mean, you, you you do, especially if you're an entrepreneur, you know, or you really believe in something and you want to try to make it happen. No one's going to believe in it more than you. It's your job to convince others why, you know, your idea or your product or whatever is you know, the right one for them, the best, the one that's, you know, needed. And you're going to meet a lot of skeptical or naysayers or just folks who, you know, don't understand or not seeing what you're seeing. And you have to have it in you to take the negative and to switch it to a positive or take whatever is coming at you that may be an obstacle or something and make it your strength and choose your sacrifices and go for it. For me personally, I was like, I'm going to go all in. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. But I'm going to know I tried. I'm going to know I gave it my all. And I really could not have done anything more to make this happen. And if I reached that point, you know, then I'll make different decisions. But for me, I needed to be able to answer the question to myself. Did I give it my all? Could I have done more? Did I do something wrong? Can we try this? You know, any type of entrepreneur, if you're going to start your own restaurant or if you're going to start a line of sauces or spices or whatever, you know, it's you got to keep asking yourself important questions and be honest with your answers. There is a little nugget there that for anyone who wants to learn this, one of the key secrets to starting up your own thing, rewind this and listen to that, that little segment back again, because there will be so many times in life that someone says to you that isn't possible because that won't happen. I've tried it, didn't work. There isn't going to be anyone that's interested in that product. And if you listen to that and you pay, give that too much weight and gravitas, you'll end up doing nothing because you'll believe someone else's word over your own. That is one of the biggest, biggest bits of advice I think anyone can take away, which is that people are, they have put their perspectives on everything, whether that's culturally, whether that's life lessons. But if you truly believe that something will work and you are prepared to go all in and dedicate your time and to make those sacrifices, it's not always going to come out 100% all the time because life doesn't work like that. But even when you fall short, you'll still learn and you'll develop and you'll be able to move forward. And I think that's really powerful stuff, Alice. I appreciate that a lot. So on the flip side, and to, to wrap this up because we're coming towards the end of our time together, has there any been uh, any major sacrifices that you had to make setting up your businesses? And if so, what were they? And how did you navigate those? I would say, you know, I always, there are definitely times that I have sacrificed, you know, things that I personally wanted to do for myself, because it was, 
you know, I didn't have time or there was something that I felt was more important to do. And it could be something as simple as like, I joke around, like I've been trying to get my nails done for the past like three years, basically. Every time I'm like, I'm going to just go get my nails done. And I'm not somebody that like gets my nails done often, but it, I feel like for me, that's always been the time where like, I'm just, I can't do anything because somebody is literally doing like washing and prepping my hands. So I can't be on a device. I can't touch anything. And anyway, it's, so it's kind of funny because I still haven't gone around to it and I just haven't prioritized myself in, in that sense. Um, you know, I sacrificed security to a certain extent when I quit my job. I was really proud of what I, my career path at IBM because of how I kind of navigated it. And I spent a lot of time actually mentoring younger folks at IBM to give them the example of, you know, you don't have to be here for 30 years to get to an executive level. And, you know, and, and a lot of, I know my peers appreciated that because of generational differences and, and expectations. So, you know, I sacrificed, I would say, you know, I wouldn't say my reputation, but I spent a lot of time building, you know, my reputation and my personal brand within the company and to start over as a startup founder, quite frankly, and I had venture capitalists basically say, well, 13 years at IBM doesn't necessarily work to your advantage in the startup world, right? People saw me as institutionalized. I had kind of jokes around like, oh, do you know how to do this for yourself? Or do you have a team to do it? Or do you have a secretary? And, you know, they were playing, you know, poking fun. But, you know, what they were saying was, do you have the grit? Can you roll up your sleeves and do this stuff? because you've been working in a 400,000 person company for the past, you know, X amount of years. So sacrificing, I would say what I have, what I dedicated my 13 years prior to culinary agents, that was very hard, as well as a safety net or whatever the safety net was of, you know, a, a retirement plan and starting over, you know, and, and I did it at a later age, you know, I was 31 when I started culinary agents and, you know, all the startup folks were coming, graduating from school in their early twenties and, you know, raising money against, you know, all odds. And that was challenging. And, you know, one might say I put some personal things on hold because I was really, you know, recognizing that starting a family on top of starting a business at that time was not healthy for me and not not possible. So that was a, a sacrifice that, and, and I'm very fortunate and lucky that, my now husband agreed with my plan, my master plan at the time. I could have gone in any direction, but, and now I have a, a beautiful three-year-old that, you know, I enjoy chasing after in between conference calls. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate that honest and, and candid answer. And yeah, I appreciate also you've probably got some running around the house to do in, in the next five minutes, but to to draw this to a neat close, were there any areas that, through your experience and your work in, in both tech and also the hospitality sector, that you feel our audience really need to hear? Like, is there anything that's been transformative or that you just feel that our attention should be on at this moment in time? You know, it's going to be a bit contradictory. I'm going to say slow down a bit. I am just notorious for being impatient and fast moving and sometimes jumping the gun on things, um, which is part of my, I'll say overall brand, right? My team laughs at me because I'm like, go, go, go. And I create my own, you know, deadlines like that. But, you know, with all this technology, with all of the information, it's like, take a minute, take a minute, you know, do your research before you make decisions. Now more than ever, there's information out there. And there's people creating content. And sometimes that content is not real, is not fully true. Take a minute for yourself. Disconnect a little bit for a minute. Go enjoy. Enjoy the things that you enjoy. And if you don't know what those things are, go find out what those things are. You know, I actually happen to love dining at restaurants. And every now and then, you know, just sitting at the bar by myself and having, you know, a bite, an appetizer, whatever, and just kind of observing the room, like that's some of the stuff that like feeds my energy and fills my bucket. Everybody has something that fills their bucket, like figure out what that is and try and just make time for it. Because I think with, with everything, everything's just gonna get faster and faster and there's going to be more and more information and there's going to be more things and easier ways to do things. And, you know, I think people are going to kind of get into overload unintentionally. So take a minute, take care of yourself figure out what fills your bucket. It could be anything and just make time for it on a regular basis. 
Lovely. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's almost, it's not just a hospitality curse, it's an entrepreneurial curse as well, where uh, you learn that if a, if you have a brain fart and it comes up with a random idea at three o'clock in the morning, you're not <laughs> going to be happy unless you've scratched that hit and put it in place. <laughs> I say, I'll close it out with, I started using this like voice dictation app because I found that now when I take my daughter to school, I have because I live in the city, I don't have a car, my kind of commuting time is now drop off and pick up for school. And I'll have ideas, but I'm like pushing the stroller or I'm like walking, dodging cars in traffic. And I'm like, I gotta get this idea down. So I started just like flip over to my voice dictation and I just like blurt out my, you know, ideas. And I have like a running list of (laughs) notes from my, you know, drop off and pick up uh, (laughs) commute. Isn't it funny though? Like, how many? I mean, I'm conscious of your time, but I also have a similar sort of process. But how many of those notes do you actually listen back to, or they just sit there? And at some stage, something will happen in the future, and you go, "Wait, I was crossing the road at that time with a with a stroller in my hand, and I just made a note about that. Uh, that was three months ago." Oh no! Right. I send those notes into my inbox, into my email, and then some of them are like to dos and action items, and you know, true to me, I'll have like work to dos mixed with like what I need to pick up at the grocery store versus like what I'm cooking for dinner and <laughs> all jarbled into one. And then I, I, I got to like separate and do them. But, That's tough. but yes, there's definitely some ideas that make it to the list. And then I give myself a laugh when I open it up later on and realize that I inadvertently had done them. Like I didn't look at the note, but I had, you know, implemented whatever idea or at least got it into the fold and so those are times when i'm really proud of myself that my memory is still working you know (laughs) yes no i'm glad and that there is a whole other subject on that but again time is money and time is impact so thank you ever so much for for joining me uh, on this week's episode i hope that that was okay thank you chris that was so fun (laughs) good and if people wanted to find out more where can they find the main businesses what what the links culinaryagents.com and hospitalitycareerpaths.com Lovely, thank you ever so much we'll put them in the show notes as well